Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the show. Fernando. Welcome to the show. You picked a great time to do that. I'm trying to get out of this. Nothing sucks worse than ordering, like, what you think is going to come on a spool, and then it doesn't. I know, man. I don't know why. This morning, we have a 2015 Ford Mustang Roush Edition. It's got a supercharger. We're gonna be putting a big Alpine system in it. All this stuff sitting here on the bench behind me. But before we take a look at that, let's take a look and see what this has from the factory so we know what we're getting rid of. First up, one of the cool features about the Mustang. When you buy the premium audio package, you get a six and a half in the bottom of the door, you get a mid-range, and then up here on the eight pillar, you get a tweeter. This is one of the reasons why I bought my Mustang, and at some point, hopefully, I'll put a stereo in the car to take advantage of it. But let's concentrate on this one. It's got an eight inch touchscreen in the dash with a USB location down here, as well as a USB hub, SD card slot, and all those fun things here in the center console. A couple things about this radio that make this radio unique is that you can use an iData MFT1 kit to replace this, which is what we're gonna be doing today because we have a big Alpine 409 halo that's going in the dash. Or you can use the iData interface going into a DSR1 to replace the factory amplifier and get eight channels of preamp level output. This is awesome because we have a lot of choices on what we can do. Keep the radio, get full preamp, get rid of the radio, and obviously get full preamp there. Makes it real fun, real unique, pretty awesome. This, the factory subwoofer, is this lower speaker here in the bottom of the door. Obviously, we're not gonna be putting a subwoofer there. We have a box with two tens that he actually brought with him. There's two more six and a half inch in the back. Those are gonna be coaxials. And speaking of the back, let's head back there and we'll talk about the kind of room we have to put amplifiers and stuff like that. Now, in the Mustang, Ford very rarely gives you a spare tire. Most of the time it comes with a big piece of foam that goes right here, a fix a flat kit, and that's it. There's there's nothing else. Every now and then you'll find one that actually has a spare tire. I'm sure it's something you have to pay for. It's usually a piece of carpeted board that goes over this. He just bought the car and it came with this, an upgraded hardwood panel. It's actually kind of nice because usually when we do our amp racks here, we have to build something up out of the center to keep it from sagging. We won't have to do this on this one. Yay. This is the 210s box he had in his previous Mustang. He had a 2010 before this one. It fits into here minus the rubber mat, which he's like, could you guys throw that away? And I was like, yeah. This will give us plenty of room to mount our amplifiers, crossovers. One of the things when working on a Mustang, which we'll show you in a little bit later, is wire routing. A lot of people always want to go this way and this way. You don't want to do that and we'll talk about that later on we have a stack of equipment that needs to go in this car let's take a look at it we're gonna go with the ilx f409 halo big nine inch floating screen in the dash mft1 kit he's going with x type s65s for the rear coaxles and he's gonna go with the x type s 165c in the door as we said it's a three-way set alpine makes these guys here which is the 30 mc is their universal three inch mid-range that we hope will fit in the location up high in the door. We will be running wires up to the tweeters because in this, the mid-range and the tweeters share the same channel. We're going to be going full active. The RA90S, it's Alpine six channel staggered power amplifier. And of course, we'll be doing fast rings and roadkill on the doors. This is going to be the amplifier to power the subs. He had this there again from his previous 2010 Mustang install, which is the X-Series monoblock. We're going to use that again to power those two Alpine R-Type subs. This is our Mustang adapter that we build because you need something thin and the Metron packs are too thick. We need to test fit this with our X-Type speaker to make sure it is the right size. And if it's not, redesign it and then we'll get those cut out on the laser as well as compare these to our existing mount to see if they'll fit. Well, that is the task at hand. And as soon as Fernando gets done redoing the tech flex onto the roll, he's gonna get that door panel off so that we can take a look at those factory speakers and make sure ours will fit. With the door off, we can kind of see what we're dealing with and the area that we want to focus on because we're not gonna do a full sound treatment to this. We're gonna do what we call our basic plus, which is mainly concentrating around the speakers itself and treating the door panel because this thing's plastic and it likes to rattle. The full baked potato or the ground zero package that we do would cover the whole door panel, but that gets expensive and we know not everyone's wanting to do that. Looking at the factory speakers we can see it's just like a generic six and a half inch woofer but this is the problem that you run into as you can see this is it this is all you have and if you look close at the factory fast ring you, you can see where the factory digs right into this when using an aftermarket speaker they're usually big this is how thick the 
aftermarket adapters are and what happens is by the time you put the speaker in and the ring you're hitting the door be very careful when choosing a speaker and or make your own baffles like we're gonna do this is the smaller driver here another problem you run into it's the same thing this foam here presses up against the door you see how recessed in the factory speaker is the temptation to just pull this out and put a new one in is just oh i want to do that if you do though what's going to happen is aftermarket speaker is going to be thick it's going to rest up against the door every time it moves it'll hit the door cause a bunch of rattling and or blow the speaker taking this out and making a whole new bracket system that we do which moves the aftermarket speaker in a little bit further gives it room to move is what you want to do and you can just trace this use it as your template over here to the bench and take a look at these speakers first up is we're going to take a look at those components the xs 65 c's for those of you interested in high res these are high res certified inside the box you get some information on the tweeters you get the warranty card it's two pieces of foam bag of zip ties some double-sided tape screws sticky tape for the tweeters more screws for the speakers alpine logos for the grills the tweeters themselves are huge they come with two passive crossovers for the tweeter if you open them up on the inside here you'll see where they have attenuation zero and plus or minus three and then they have a normal or reverse phase here which is an interesting jumper for sure i believe they do that because once these are all soldered into place obviously you'd have to cut it so making those jumpers in there is kind of a nice feature two grills if you need them taking a closer look alpine uses a neo magnet with this they use an aluminum basket treated cloth cone rubber surround really nice speaker the bracket we are going to use we have predetermined screw holes in this that we laser out. Looks like our speaker will fit, but it is kind of swimmy. And it's easy enough for us just to change this size and then print them with that new size. Knowing what we know now about this awesome speaker, let's take a look at the speaker we are taking out. One of the reasons why we have to make these brackets, as you can see, this is what the factory speaker looks like. It has this weird hole pattern. Yeah, it's a six and a half, but it's definitely not a screw in style six and a half. If you put the two over one another like this, you can see that it might not even screw into the metal of the door. It uses a standard style magnet, has some form of a composite basket, treated paper cone, which I find funny considering it's going into the door, it's going to get wet and all that, but apparently they have really good paper. Has a foam surround, small voice coil. A couple things to think about when looking at a factory speaker, because I know we discount them as just junky or clunky or whatever thing, but look at what the factory is doing. They're putting foam on the back of the speaker so that when this screws into the car there's nice tight water sealed no vibration and you question whether you should put a fast ring on a speaker or not or some form of a gasket material on the front side I don't think I've ever taken a speaker out of a car that hasn't had some form of a gasket material and or the door would go over this and this is like slide inside of it so they're definitely doing that from the factory but if you'll notice all these little marks right here you can see where the factory grill is hitting it so even though they did all these great things they still didn't do a wonderful design to figure out how this speaker was actually gonna fit inside of the car that's kind of funny right they didn't even get it right and they made the car it's important to know that if the factory's doing it there's no reason you shouldn't do it because it's there for a reason to make that size correction measure across the baskets grab these, the inner circle, make sure we select center point enlargement, type in our new diameter, and that'll shrink that into place. Label it Alpine X type, export it out as an SVG file. With that done, I can load the software into the laser and we'll see what these things look like. Speakers mounted in place. For these, we used M5 screws, foam here on the back, our little gap for the wire to come out. Mounts like this in the door. This is the top. The wire will come out like this. We have our terminals facing down. That way, when the rain comes down the door, they're here on the bottom. I like to do that. I don't like them up here at the top. Just personal preference. Now, I need to get this off to Fernando so he can finish the door. The next speaker we want to take a look at is that 30MC. Inside the box, get your Alpine warranty, and that's it. And these are their cute little mid-range. This uses a standard style magnet. It does have aluminum basket, it don't drop them. It has some form of a plastic or mica based cone. It says Alpine on it, rubber surround. It's a cute little speaker for sure. But what we need to find out is if these will fit in the existing brackets we made. To do that, we need to know some measurements off of the 
back of the speaker. Here on the laptop, we've pulled up the brackets we make or the Mustang. As you can see from the rendering, it, it looks an awful lot like their speaker. A couple differences between the Alpine and this is it uses an EO magnet. It is fairly shallow, but when you compare the two, and this is what I was talking about, you can see how inset this driver is compared to this top piece of foam. When you take this driver and you just set it on top of here like this, our driver is going to stick out way further, meaning this surround is sticking out way further than this surround. It's about a quarter of an inch difference. And that will cause this to hit the door panel. Good news is it looks like it's gonna be about the right size. Our design currently has a 2.89 inch opening. Measuring across the speakers at the two screw points, we go out to what we have currently. Ours is for a much, much bigger speaker. Anytime we're gonna modify an existing layout, we just create a duplicate of it, close our original, and rename the one we are gonna modify. Select center point. And what I mean by select center point is that you can pick wherever you want the circle to enlarge from. You want to pick the center so it stays where it's at, it just grows out. Otherwise it'll move out like this or this. You also want to pick this little icon here, that means length. So whatever I do here or here, it will copy to the other size and it shrunk it down. Repeat the process. And that changes the hole. The next thing we have to look at is the screw points here. Those may be way off as well. From the front, we want to take another measurement, about the halfway point, maybe a little bit more. We want to get the measurement for that, because this is going to tell us where all our holes need to be lined up at. Coming back over here, create a new circle, move that into place, lining it up with the existing circle. The pink line there is telling us it's lined up. By doing that, we can see our screw holes are way off and we're gonna have to fix those, line those back up with that. The easiest way to do that is to come in and drop crosshairs, move the circles into their new location, and then repeat the process on the bottom one. The reason why we have two different ones listed here is because one is driver, one is passenger. Because of the logos, we can't just flip them. If we didn't put a logo on it, then we could make one size to fit all. With that done, we no longer need that path. We can remove it. And we have our new speaker hole with the new, we have the new speaker hole that'll fit this and the whole pattern is now for this particular speaker. One other thing I needed to do to these design is that the previous version of these, Fernando has wanted a hole somewhere on here to run the wire through. The way it's mounted now, if you'll notice this guy here, it comes through here and it attaches on this. Fernando wants me to put a hole somewhere in this area around where the Mustang logo is for the wire to come up through the back side. With those final adjustments made, we have our brackets for these. I'm gonna export this, we'll get it into the laser, we'll see what these look like. The laser just got quiet, that means it is done. And here's what we've come up with. By cutting all these at the same time, I've maximized my waist. Let's get these out and put some speakers in them and make sure we did a good job. This groove here is for the wire to pass up underneath. Speakers are nice and tight. Screw holes line up just the way we want them to. So this is a win. Next is the little door pod mount. Lines up just the way we want it to. Next step for these is to, next we'll take our self-threading drill bit. This is an M4. And we'll add in our threads for our screws. Acrylic does not scratch acrylic. So to get this paper off, just take one of the pieces that we have here, pull this stuff right off. Next, we'll grab our foam, just like the factory speaker, put foam on the back. Apply foam to the back of the speaker itself. This has to get sit flush up against the metal. Next, we'll add some foam to the front just to finish it off because this is sitting further back than the factory. So we wanna make sure that we get it as close as we can, get it up into the door, and that's what we have. We have one done, do the same for the other side. No installation is gonna be without its challenges ever. There's always gonna be something. And here we are with ours, this tweeter. The way this mount is attached is they heat 
mold it in this bracket. And then the tweeter just kind of like angles in and clips into place. There's these three clips here, one here in the back that's really hard to get to, and these two in the front. Prying up on them in the tweeter, as you can see, it just kind of flops out. And this is what we're dealing with, cloth tweeter. I'm assuming a small Neo magnet. There is a capacitor on the tweeter itself. That is how the factory mid-range and the tweeter are on the same channels. They're just using the natural roll-off point of this mid-range, and then the cap on the tweeter is adding in that tick-tick sound. But keep in mind, they share a channel, so if you're gonna do an active system like we're doing, and or a passive system that has a three-way passive crossover, running new wires to the tweeters it's something you're gonna have to do. And the reason why we picked these tweeters to run the wires to is because they're in the car and we don't have to go through the boot. Now the fun starts of trying to figure out how to put this much bigger tweeter into this location that it clearly isn't gonna fit into. Front grill does pop off. It has three clips that you can reach from the inside. I take it off so I can kind of see what is going on there. The tweeter isn't gonna fit in this location from the front. I mean, if it did, it would look, it would look pretty bad because it would stick out like that. I mean, I'm sure it'd be okay for some people, but what that does give me an idea of how much room I have that I could get this in from the backside. Like everything in a Mustang, it's just gonna be a little bit harder. Get this out, which is what I need to do. I need to be careful because obviously I just don't wanna grab a big drill bit and drill through. I could run the risk of coming through this. We do have this cool drill bit here. This is a countersink drill bit. As you can see, it has the hole. We picked these up at the cheap tool store, but it works perfect for drilling these weld points out. Just loosen that right up. With some prying from our cool pry tool, we can get these things out. And we have this cool guy here that we're going to play with. Now it's time to stare at this for a little bit and come up with a solution to this problem. It's gonna take a couple, that's for sure. I've stared at this for a while to come up with what I think is the best plan so far. One of the things I did miss when unboxing these speakers is that there are more parts for the tweeters located in the bottom of it. So it has a flush cup here. It has two angle mounts. It has the threaded back side for this cup so that you could drill it into a panel, which we've done before. However, none of this stuff is gonna help me because it's all way too big. What I'm thinking though, that the tweeter is the right size for the opening, but we don't want it to come in through the front. I have this area back here that I can use to attach something to, and I have this clip area here, which has this nice flat area. The idea is I'll make a piece that goes from here to here. This is an M6 rivet nut cert that we use in a car, but it fits perfect into these three holes. I can add some glue to it, stick it in there, and that'll allow me to put a nut into this. And then what I'm hoping to do is notch this so I have a panel that slides into place and then screws down and then will hold my tweeter into its location. That's kind of the thought I have right now. To get that to work though, I'm gonna grab my laptop, my calipers, start taking some measurements, start manipulating some shapes in the software to see what we come up with. I've opened up the computer with a blank page to start doing this. And what I wanna start with is the length from here to here. And once I get that, I'm gonna draw a square. I'm gonna add in a circle for this. And then we're just gonna build off of that. Most of the time when we do this, we have a generic shape that we're going for, meaning we have like a speaker bracket or something like this. But with this, we're just starting from thin air and trying to come up with something that works. So this is gonna be a little bit different process. And because of that, we want to deselect, maintain proportions. Because the proportions aren't necessarily gonna be the same as we move on. Looking at this gives me a really rough idea of what I'm kind of thinking. I wanna print this and see if I'm on the right path first. I need to figure out if I need to make it out of quarter inch, if I need to make it out of eighth inch, but first I just want to cut it real quick, see how it falls into my thought process. And for that, I'm just gonna cut it out of a piece of cardboard. Line my cardboard back up just in case. We're gonna cut a second one, but here's our first one. Let's take a look. Right, the diameter of the tweeter is spot on. Our hole lines up 
One of the things I'm gonna have to do on this is this is a solid piece right here. I wanna remove that area there so that my piece will tongue into that. For that, I'll just use my roto zip. So I didn't know how big that could be. Now I'm gonna trim this down until I can get it to sit in there the way I want it. We have some ideas on what we need to change. This is look number two. Prototype number two, that fits way better. Exactly how I wanted it to go in, so that's a plus. I'm gonna play with this some more, make sure this is what I wanna do, and then we'll get our final printed. So this is the piece that I've come up with. Made it out of clear right now because I just want to look through and make sure I can see everything that's doing. I've changed this end a little bit compared to the second. I added some pen markings on here as well as I added this slit here. And the reason why I added this is because I'm going to twist this and I, I don't want to twist the whole thing. I only want to twist this little area here to have it line up better with my screw inside of this. I will take my heat. Start heating this up. Hot enough to twist. It's kind of like lava and it just, it like, it, it you only gotta get it to a certain temperature and then it just kind of accelerates itself and gets like super pliable. Wait for that to chill. And after a couple iterations and back and forth and actually test fitting it in the car, this is what we've ended up with. It'll lock into place here, screw down. I just need to heat this up, twist it into place, and this thing will be ready to get into the car. For that, we'll be using a heat gun. get it into the car. We made a couple different iterations of it while we were coming up with this one. This one got pretty close, but then I had to remove some of this because it was hitting airbag side. It is super tight in this whole area here. All right, it's nice and cool. I'm gonna slide this into the car and we'll take a look. Fernando just informed me the door is done. Let's take a closer look at it. First up is the two and a half inch mid-range mounted in place. There's the hole you wanted me to drill. Fast ringed up. Moving on down to the X Type 6.5. Of course, you can see the whole area here has sound treatment on it. The fast ring is in place. It doesn't have to be thick. Remember, that factory speaker was very narrow. That's why we had to make our own bracket. He's notched out for the screws, and the fast ring is not sitting on the surface of the speaker. You don't want to stick your fast ring to the speaker if you need to get to take the speaker out. Something, God forbid, happens to the speaker. You don't want to have to peel off the fast ring and then sell them another fast ring. If this part of the door is done. We also added sound treatment to the back of the door. Dinger Roadkill Ultimate in this whole area here, concentrating on what is closest to the speaker and then moving away from that. The farther you go, the less you have to worry about it. And this is all set. He's gonna get this door panel on and then that door panel will be done, right? That's it. Make sure there's nothing in the door. There we go. I once had a Mustang door panel that had a penny stuck in it and would just sit there and do this. That's, that's, that's what happened, yeah. They took it back to the dealer, couldn't figure it out. It's like, dude, it's a penny. Stop dropping coins in your doors. Don't drop coins, drop hundreds. After some fun and excitement, remembering I needed to run the Bluetooth mic to get that done, we have the tweeter in place. I'll tell you right now, these a pillars on a Mustang are not the easiest pillars to get back in. There's a clip way up here at the front that just doesn't ever want to line up the way it's supposed to. No big deal, a little patience, some time. We got it in there. We popped the grill off just to make sure that the tweeter stayed put and that it's not loose or anything like that. And it is, it's nice and tight. Grill pops back on. Now we have our nice new Alpine three-way set rocking in the driver's side. Fernando is still finishing up the passenger side, but he's almost done. I have this one left to get on and then it's on to removing the radio, figuring out what we did here with the amplifier wiring. And of course the amplifiers themselves, getting that board made and start doing that stuff. Yay. For the rear speakers, we're going with the XS65, six and a half inch coaxial. They're high res, just like the fronts. The warranty card comes out. They're a lot like the separates in that you have grills, they're identical. 
You have some screws, you have the Alpine logos for the grills, and you have the two speakers themselves. And these speakers are identical, with the exception of the tweeter, to the components. And that's not that this isn't the same tweeter, it is. What I mean by that is that because it's a coaxial, the tweeter's mounted in the center. Has the same basket, the same Neo, the same aluminum. It is the same tweeter, same cone, same everything. It is literally a high-end coaxial version of the front speaker, which is awesome. These will be up in the rear deck. If you want to make it biampable, you can. The tweeter wire runs out of it here, so you can remove it and hook it up to two amplifiers. There is no exposed crossover, so my guess is that the base blocker is built into the housing for the tweeter. There is enough room that is for sure from those front tweeters there's enough room to do that we've made brackets already for them these will get mounted in speakers will get attached to them same way as we did the fronts we'll put foam on the front and back of these let's get these over into the car and see how they look are you having fun in the back of the car uh no you sure man this is, this is this is no fun at all getting the fast rings put in just the, the last piece of the house well, what did you do back here? Um, nothing crazy, just one sheet. Focus on the speaker like we always do here, this side, right here in the center. We're gonna put the fast rings on the top. What are these little pieces of? Little pieces is the previous, whatever they have in here, has so many holes. They have one here, one here, here, here. Like you can see, it's like a, probably like previous. Ground points on underneath Ground seat. points underneath the seat. Yeah, that makes total sense. have an oil over here. Don't ever ground your amps underneath your seats like this, guys. It's a really bad move. Especially but... next to the gas tank. <laughs> well, that's always bad. But you know, if the ground ever gets loose, it's gonna spark and it's sitting on that plastic or foam, which is flammable. It's a good way to catch your car on fire. Yeah. I know, right? What are the odds? I mean, you have plenty of ground over here. You know? I know, agreed. Right. But yeah, that's it. Just right. finishing this thing, can go home. <laughs> He's finished putting the rear speakers in, and there's a little bit of sound treatment left over from what we sold him. Explain to me what you're gonna do. We're gonna cover the trunk lid. This is gonna rattle, trying to cover the most as I can. That's so nice of you. I know. And it's done. There you go, That's nice, it. good yeah. job. A little baked potato action on there. Yeah. Black on black. Don't cross the line. Don't cross the line. Don't cross your line, man. Stay in your lane. A good friend of ours, Marty, Canadian Marty as we call him. What he likes to do is take the green tape and tape along the edge so mm -hmm. that he knows how to keep it in. Whatever you do, you don't want, whether it be a door panel or a trunk lid like this, you don't want any of this to ever be seen. And you wanna make sure that you keep it up high enough just in case it ever gets really, really melty, like some of this cheap stuff like this. <laughs> it will melt and drip, which is really gross. Right. One reason why you wanna buy the good stuff. Before we start wiring up the radio, getting a dash kit made and all those fun things, I like to get the factory radio out of the car, just because it's kinda of like a bad luck thing. You start on that, you get all wired up and you realize, oh, something's different. Yeah, it kind of sucks. This way we'll be able to make sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And we're gonna need some of those parts anyways. We need the little wings off of the side of the screen to attach to our new radio mount. To get this right out of the dash, it starts with removing this top part of the center console. Normally there's a little piece of plastic right here that needs to come out in front of the gear shifter. This one doesn't have it. There are two seven millimeters there, remove them. On the side of the center console located here and on this side, there are little plastic pieces that need to come off and there'll be more screws located behind those. They're all seven millimeters. With the exception of the ones that are not factory, like that one. The side panels have a couple clips and some magnets on them. Just pop those off and the whole thing will come off. It's the same on the other side. We're removing the center console. Start in the back, put the gear shifter all the way back and just kind of work your way this way towards the rear of the car where it says shaker here that also needs to come out and there's going to be more seven millimeters behind it once you've gotten that far that's good enough for this area what we need to remove now is this top part of the dash here get to the two screws that are located behind it Normally when removing the dash, these pieces will come with them. 
However, he's obviously done some modifications to this and that isn't the case. The screws we need to get to though are located behind the gauges that he's put in the car. There are two extra clips located behind this. That would be what would normally come out when you remove this whole gauge cluster, which when they didn't screw it back in, obviously that isn't the case. Now we can continue to get our radio out. Behind this trim panel are two plugs for the air conditioner, one plug for the cigarette lighter, and then the factory USB that is not going to do anything for us. And the whole unit comes out. Other than clean this thing up a little bit, there's nothing we have to do to it. This is the lower control unit here. It has your CD if you have a CD. This is the actual radio. Up top is the control screen. Normally there's a bunch of seven millimeters here to remove it. Not the case here. Someone's pulled this out. On the back of the top screen is what looks like a USB. And it is, but it's not an actual USB per se like you would think. And the big plug that is going to be where our camera plugs into. Reaching up behind, I can get the main unit out. We don't need this for anything. This is done. There's nothing we need off of this. Behind here, inside, closer deep into the bowels of the dash, you'll find a two antennas. One that's mustard colored, one that's black. The black is the FM, the mustard color is the series. Sirius XM. If you're going to be retaining Sirius XM, you need a SAT1 antenna adapter. That'll plug into this and allow you to retain it. It's not all fun and games. We don't just get to throw a new radio in here and everything is great. Unless you're doing a short chassis radio, in which case, yeah. We're not doing that. We're doing a normal depth single din back. Means we got some work we need to do. We need to remove this whole piece here out of the way. The easiest way to do that is to cut it along the sides here and here, not along the back. There's wiring harnesses and stuff that are in the way. We found that the best tool to use to do cuts like this is one of these floorboard cutters. Dremel makes a carbide bit that works well for both plastic and metal. One of the nice thing about it is it doesn't create a lot of vibration, which is key because you don't want to roll the gauge clusters over. There's no more room behind there to be had. The air conditioner's in the way. We're not gonna be doing anything with that. Hopefully we have enough depth. We have put full-size double din floating radios in here before, but I do like to worry. And because I'm worried, I'm gonna head over to the bench right now and build this kit so that we can get it into the car and test fit it to make sure everything does what it needs to do. The radio we're putting in is the ILX F409. This guy here is a loaded down Alpine radio, has a ton of features. Let's take a look inside and see what they are. When you open the radio, the first thing you find is this cardboard box. Inside the cardboard box is your bag of harnesses, your owners and instruction manual, and then nothing else. Next is this big thing of bubble wrap that doesn't come out all that easy. Warning, this unit will not power up until the power plate is installed. I cannot stress enough, you have to have this little lock in place before this thing will power up. We get a ton of phone calls of people like, dude, it doesn't work, what happened? Did you, what? Uh, I, big pink thing. It's literally the size of the screen. It's next to the screen and it's underneath the screen. So you can't physically get to the screen without removing this. It has the screw that you need. Put it in the bottom of the box where the screen goes. Don't need that. I like the fact that they give you this cool little felt fuzzy case thing to hold over this until you're done. And another thing I really, really like is you see the tab here. Alpine puts clear plastic over all of their screens. Oh, I wish everyone would do this. It's so nice. It just protects the screen until we're done. This mounts exactly the same way as any of their other floating screens. It has a screw here on the side, it has two screws, one on this side, one on the other, and this is what's gonna allow this to tilt. Then you have two screws here. That's a total of four. It allows you to adjust the elevation when in the car you have these mounts here that when it comes in you have to put these screws in and then the last piece to go over the top is that little locking mechanism there's two beauty panels that click over the sides here to hide all these mechanisms you don't hop into the car and see this and so we're ready for it we can put it back into this I like to put it in upside down that way if it's on the table you guys know why digging deeper into the box we find the brain unit this is the main unit let's take 
a little bit closer look at it. If you need to, you can remove these two screws here, push this in, and we'll then occupy these two. And that'll sink it into the dash some. I can tell you right now, we're not gonna need to do that in this car because of the way the dash is shaped. We're gonna need as much out as we can. There's also two screws on the top. That's a total of four that you have to remove in order to sink it into the dash. Looking at the back of the unit, there's two cables hanging off. One is your FM, and the other one is your Sirius XM for your SVX 300 tuner module. HDMI in, HDMI out. This has a single USB fan. All these other dedicated plugs that are in this bag, let's take a look. There's two bags of screws and they're totally different. The one that has the black screws with the Loctite on it is for attaching the screen to the radio. The one that just has the silver screws in it are to attach the main unit to our dash kit that we're gonna be putting in. This piece here is a bracket to lock in the HDMI. I'm gonna be honest with you, very rarely does this fit any other HDMI other than Alpine. So this little bag here is the beauty trim that goes on the side of the screen to hide all the mechanism. We have a single little guy here that says iData Link. This is important. This is what's gonna allow us to use the RR. Comes with one USB connector. The RCAs, the aux jack, and all that are on their own dedicated white cable. Do yourself a favor. If you're not putting amplifiers in the car, still plug this in. In. This is an expensive piece. There's no reason not to put it in. Don't leave it in the box. Just put it into the car. Zip tie it up. Do whatever you need to do. Trying to get one of these after the fact is a pain in the butt. The main power harness. We'll talk about this once we get to the RR installation. Going back to the back of the radio, the little iData harness is going to attach here in the top right. The RCA harness is going to attach here. It does have a steering wheel control input. If you're doing something other than iData, you can plug that in. Your microphone is located here. They are both the same size, so make sure you read and don't accidentally get them wrong. The main power harness goes here in the corner. Looking at the RCA harness, let's take a moment and kind of go over this particular radio's features that it has. It has six channel four volt output with a front, rear, and sub, and if you'll notice, they're all staggered, which makes it kind of nice. They don't just have a giant bundle at one spot. It has one camera input. The second yellow here is the auxiliary input. If you're doing RR, it's going to tell you to plug your RR input into this, which means that the input here won't be used either. Fortunately, most phones don't use aux jacks anymore. And then the remote EXT here is for if you're doing some form of an overhead. Speaking of RR, for integration, we're gonna be using the MFT-1 kit along with a regular RR. This kit is really nice. It's designed to work with that factory four to eight inch screen. So you can keep that whole front bezel, all the knobs and controls, we're not replacing it. Makes it really nice. This is what we're going to use to cover the hole and line it up with the eight inch. There are four metal brackets in here, a set of A's and a set of B's and the instructions that'll tell you what brackets you need out of this. And then you're gonna remove the brackets off the factory screen and attach those to these brackets to mount it into place. It comes with the antenna adapter. And then it comes with this hub here, which is really nice. It has HDMI, it has an aux jack, and it has dual USB. On this car, we only have one USB on the radio, so one of these won't be used. For that, we have these little USB covers we just put in place and that denotes it's not going to work. Depending on what forge you're going with, it has two different size bezels to snap into place where that factory hub was. Bag of screws to attach the metal bracket. There's three wiring harnesses in the box. The first one here is the backup camera retention harness. This will attach where the factory screen is. The second harness here is the main radio harness. This will attach it to the lower brain box of the radio. The screen and the radio in this are two separate pieces. It has RCAs on it if you are integrating into the factory amplifier. If you're not, if you just, say, have a base model, you can cut these off and just use the radio power. And then the last harness is to integrate this into the newer Fords. This is the new harness here. This is the old harness. This allows you to just simply plug into this, plug into your new Ford harness, and everything works the way it's supposed to. When I was 
opening this and I had said there's four brackets, two sets, we have to flash our RR module to get to the instruction manual to find out which brackets we need, one or two, for this install. You're gonna need the serial number of the radio, the make, year, and model of the car. On the side of the box, if you don't feel like opening it, is a USB input. Download the software to your computer, create an account, and log in. We want the green box here at the bottom. Select flash by vehicle, year, make, model. On the model, there'll be choices. In this case, we have the eight inch screen with amplifier and without amplifier. Even though we're going to be bypassing the factory amplifier, select with amplifier. Fire. Choose the steering wheel that is in your car. Zoom in to see features that it has. In our case, it's this bottom one here. Choose the radio manufacturer that you have. Type in the model number and your serial number. There's usually only one recommended firmware. It's gonna ask you what accessories you'd like to use with your radio. In this case, we will be using the MFT1 kit. It'll give you the part numbers for other things that are in the vehicle that you may want to retain. Select how you want to configure your system. In this case, we can shut off the factory amplifier now. Everything else here seems appropriate. Scan over your steering wheel controls. If there's any you'd like to change, you can. I am not a big fan of attenuation when holding the volume down. I don't want it to mute, only because we've had plenty of customers complain about that feature. When scrolling down, we have the eject button that we can reprogram if we'd like. Scan over this last page to make sure everything is exactly how you want it to be. If so, select flash. And that's pretty much it for the flashing software. Once done, if iData has done the installation for you, they'll have a video. These are really nice to watch, even if your car isn't shown, because it'll give you their thought process behind how the kit is supposed to be assembled. For us, we're gonna select Download Installation Guide. You have to scroll down until you find your vehicle. Once you've located your car, in this case, 2015 and 19 Ford Mustang with my Ford Touch and the Shaker amp, scroll down It'll show you how to disassemble the dash, what area of the dash you need to cut. And then right in the middle of the page, located right here in this dark area, it says unbox MFT1 dash kit and locate bracket set number two, discard set number one. That's what we've been looking for. If we can continue down the page, it'll show us how to assemble it, as well as the wire colorings we're going to need, and if we need to do any extra work. The nice thing about this is it shows you what every color of wire does, which I will talk about once we get to that because it's an Alpine and Alpine does do things a little bit differently than everyone else. Let's build this kit. We're gonna need the plastic bezels, the dash kit screw bags, as well as the Alpine radio screw bags. Bezel number two which it says here on the side. This says L2, R2. These we don't need. We need this bracket here and the one on the opposite side. It has two torque screws holding it in place. And to make things difficult, they are really small. They use a T8. Once those brackets are removed, set the screen someplace safe, you don't need it anymore. Grab the left hand iData bracket and the left, which has a little L on it. Set them on top of one another, screw it together. Once the brackets have been added on, grab the big bezel, and it has clips on the top and bottom of it, and it actually says top. These little nipples here go on the bottom, snap into place. As you can see now, it's nice because it holds it all together nice and tight. And this is what's gonna allow you to line up the screen into this. If you're doing a regular double din, you'll know when to stop. You're gonna be pushing it as far forward as possible because that dash is definitely tight. And then this, because we're using a single din, will either go on the top or the bottom. In this case, thinking it is gonna go on to top because we want to have the most adjustment for this screen. But before we do that, I like to get my radio attached so I know what depth it needs to be at. Most radios come with two types of screws, one with a V bottom and one with a flat bottom. This one requires the flat bottom. I like to get one side in loose, spin it over, get the other side in, that way I can line it all up and then tighten it. Make sure that everything looks good. I'm gonna pop this front panel off, I'll add the screws to this, and this guy will be all set. We can't attach the screen until this is done, but join me in the car because I wanna test fit this and make sure I have enough depth. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's very close. This harness here is in the way, but it's a harness, so we could probably move it. This metal brace back here is 
causing us some issues. I'm thinking it's going to have to come out. Our radio does go in, and if I put my hand behind here, I have some room. Not much. I don't know if all the cables are gonna fit. Fortunately, because it is the Alpine and it, it does have the wired harnesses, we're good there. And I think the USB and the HDMI will be recessed enough to not be a problem. I'm gonna have to go check those. But that metal brace here, more than likely gonna cut or damage some of the wiring we're gonna put in here. We'll use the same Rotozip tool to remove that and that'll free up all this area in the dash in order for us to put the wiring in and take advantage of all this space here behind it. One of the nice things about using this style cutter is because this blade is nice and flat, you can really push it up against the sides and make nice clean cuts so you don't have to worry about sharp metal in the dash poking into anything. Now we're free, we have all the room that we need for our new floating screen radio. Yeah, the HDMI should clear. USB is good also. All right, we're safe. And these come out of the bottom here, so they're gonna immediately go down. That bar would have caused us lots of issues. The last thing I wanna do to this before I call this done is this is gonna have a big heavy screen hanging off of it. We only have these one screw points here and here. That's not gonna be enough to hold all that weight. I'm going to take some back strap and make a second bracket that comes from this hole back here up to here so I can have two points of contact and this screen won't flop around. Much better. That'll hold this thing nice and tight in the dash. Let's so move on to the wiring harness now that the dash kit is all built. And the first thing I do on an iData harness is remove all the tape. You don't have to do that, but I like to do that. I like to remove wires that I'm not gonna need, and I like to reroute the wires to the way I like them run. To depin, we use this depinning tool here, which you can find on DNF tool drawer. We also use a razor knife. On the iData, it has these cool little silver things here that you can just push in with a razor knife to remove any of the wires and you don't need. And the reason for that is in some cases there's just extra stuff that you're not going to need for this particular installation. On the Ford, there's little tiny holes that are right above the pins. Stick the tool in and push and the wire will come out. This allows you, if you need to, you can repin the wire back in if you accidentally get the wrong one because there's just a tab that it's pushing down. Sometimes there'll be wiring that you don't need just because it's a different style car harness, meaning it's the same harness, but different configs. I like to plug my harnesses into the car first and find out if there's wiring that I don't need, can I remove it? A lot of the times, like Toyotas and stuff like that, you'll find that be the case. To me, it just makes a prettier harness. When you're not retaining the factory amplifier in the vehicle, make sure to cut off these RCAs. Don't plug them in. There's no power coming out of the RCAs that'll power speakers. These also are really nice to save if you're going to be doing any other work in different cars, you may need some RCA in. Looking in the car, this harness, the only thing it has on it is this blue yellow wire. There's nothing pinned on the other side of this. That means I don't need to even plug this harness into the car because the one wire it has, it doesn't go to anything in the car. However, that now leaves this end exposed. What I like to do then is push this down, remove it, put some shrink rack over it, and then plug it back into place. When pushed back in, give it a little tug, make sure it doesn't move. Harness is all pre-prepped, ready to start the next process, which is the insulation portion of it. For that, I like to use exterior test the tape. When wrapping, go from the plug side into the harness. The reason for that is you don't want to end here because if it starts to unravel, it just becomes gooey. When they're all in this spot here, we're gonna put one final wrap of tape on it to seal everything up. I also like to wrap them in their individual harnesses. I also try to unravel the harness as much as possible. I don't like wires at all like doing this. That's kind of irritating. Sometimes I'll even depin those wires, straighten them back out and repin them back in place. Once we get them all to a central hub here in the center, there again, kind of unravel them. With this one, we are gonna go this way with it and we're gonna put a piece of shrink wrap here at the end to seal it. It just makes it easier to keep all these wires nice and tight. The little T here, I switch to interior test of tape. It's a little bit more flexible, which is what I need at this point. Apply some of that to this, finishing off this intersection. I kind of treat this like a boxer would his fingers when, you know, they're getting taped up. I go between the 
the, all the wiring and it makes it a really nice flexible tape joint. I always have little pieces of leftover heat shrink that are too long, so I save those in a bin, put it over this tape seam. And that just finishes off that wrap. Cut these to length and I have my harness ready. Another thing I do is I strip off the interior Tessa tape from the camera harness because I know it's gonna get really sticky in about a month here in Florida and I retape it with the exterior. This kit is made to also work with an RR2. That's what this plug is for. I bundle that up in case they ever decide to switch out to that. It's easy enough to get to that harness. This one's all set. The ID data RR cable harness, tape up the exposed wires, leave the flag easy to see. And that leaves us the RR in the box left to deal with. Obviously we need the RR and there's two cables in here that we need. One is the four pin data connection, which is the light blue, white, black, and red cable. And the second one is the three pin, red, white, black to eighth inch, not to be confused with the four pin with the blue end on it. This is for standalone RR our use steering wheel controls. We're done with all of that. Once I unbox these out, the first thing I like to do is plug them in. I don't need them right away. However, I don't want to lose them. And in this case, plug the Alpine pigtail in also so it doesn't get lost. The next harness I'm going to address is the RCA harness. I pull all the little rubber pieces to their ends, line up the RCA so that they're stacked flat on top of one another, and I zip tie them together. Make sure when cutting your zip ties, use a flush cutter so you don't hurt yourself later when you reach into the dash for whatever reason. Cutting it on a zip tie really sucks. Once the RCAs are all lined up by themselves, I move to the other side and do the backup camera, the remote extension wire, and the aux jack. For this, I can plug my backup camera into the main harness so those harnesses are connected and they won't get lost anywhere. That moves us to the Alpine harness. And as I've been hinting to, things are a little bit different about an Alpine than, well, everybody else. You'll notice it comes with these really long orange, white, and yellow, blue. Typically orange, white is gonna be illumination or dimmer wire. On an Alpine, that is controlled via a photo strobe or a light sensor built into the screen. It does not work with your dash knob. On an Alpine, the orange, white wire on a video screen that has a backup camera, this orange white is going to be your reverse trigger wire. In most cases, that's gonna be a purple white wire. And if you look at the iData end, the purple white wire is the reverse wire. It also does have an orange output. That is illumination. We'll be capping that off and not using it. The yellow blue wire is the emergency brake wire. That's the wire that needs to be on, off, on when you want to access the radio functionality. On most radios, it is a light green wire. And on the iData, it is also light green. If you're gonna be using that feature, make sure you hook up this yellow blue to light green. Alpine also has a blue and a blue with a white stripe. The blue is gonna be for your amplified antenna turn on, and the blue white is gonna be to turn on your amplifier or the remote turn on output. Don't get those two confused. However, it's not like the old school radios where when you switched from FM over to something else, it would shut off the blue white. It's just how powerful the circuit is in the radio. Black, which is ground, red, which is accessory, and yellow is constant 12 volts. And then the speaker wires, white is driver's front, Gray is passenger front, green is driver's rear, and purple is passenger rear. Solids are positive, stripes are negative. Match those up to your harness, you'll be all set. I'm gonna get these soldered up and we'll take a look at the harness once it's all done. With a few zip ties, solder, and heat shrink, this is what we end up with. On this end, we have our RR as it moves along, the backup camera retention input, as well as the main power plug for the radio. Those wires move along here into our iData connection that goes to the back of the radio, the main RCAs. I've hooked in the backup camera as well as the aux input coming from the RR. Our main harness is over here, and then this pigtail coming off is for future use as well as the remote turn on. On here is an accessory constant 12 volts and ground that we can plug into if need be as well as the remote turn on. So this harness is all set and ready to go into the car. Let's go back here to the spare tire well and we'll start the process of figuring out how we're gonna mount the amplifiers back there. Most of the time when we do one of these, it has that cool factory cover that goes here and we're able to trace 
the shape that we need to go down inside of this. Unfortunately, with this one, we weren't so lucky, but we have some big Mobile Solutions rings, and this one just happens to be the right arc here. It's not all the way across, which is fine. There's a flat area here in the center, so we're not gonna worry about it, but that allows us to get the measurements that we need across. And then the plan is to take this and stick on half of it, router that side, peel it off, stick on this side, router that side. Then we have some tapers here that need to happen and we'll make the shape. Then we'll put it in, we'll press it down really hard to get this shape in it, we'll cut this shape out. My plan is to have it sit flush with this or stick up. I want this to stick out, it'll keep it from rocking this way, and then we'll make a C cover to go over it that'll hide it and we can put two screws in there and that'll hold the whole amp rack in place. We've also removed all the sides here and the reason for that is that is where we're gonna run our wiring. Our wiring is gonna come across the back up and around and towards the front of the car. The RCAs will be on this side of the car. A zero gauge will be run on this side of the car. Don't go this way because the box is gonna sit there and it will get squished unless you build the floor up or the bottom of the box, which we're not gonna do. It's way easier just to go this way. And of course, there's also some convenient grounds already located back here, here, and then one here. So it makes grounding super cool. We don't have to go up underneath the seat, ground it to the gas tank. First step is to grab some plastic. For this, we'll be using some half inch blown PVC because I want it nice and rigid and thick and I just want to use half inch. And we need a piece of paper to take some measurements and join me at the saw. The piece that I need to start out with is gonna be 25 inches wide by 26 inches deep. I have the half inch loaded here in the panel saw. And that gets us the first piece that we need. We'll take it over to the router bench and start trimming it up. To stick it down, we'll use our Mobile Solutions double-sided tape, also known as template tape. We need to line it up with this edge and the top. Set the router height. For this reason, a quad bearing quarter inch flush trim bit from Mobile Solutions. And that gets us that front shape. Need to add some tapers to the back here. For that, I'm just gonna take another measurement of how wide it needs to be. We know it's gonna come back straight like this. I need to shrink this back area down to 24 inches from the 25 and a half. We just need some straight edges. We have these pieces here for the animal. Line those up. That gives our basic shape, let's test fit it. One of the joys of working on a car is constantly changing and adapting, and even though a plan seemed like a good idea at the time, you see something like, yeah, I don't think that was a good idea. I've kind of changed my mind on how I want to do this, but let's take a look and see how it fits. Right on the money. And the nice thing is, is it's at the right height. This is right where that spare tire mount is here, and I like the way it looks like this. The only thing is, is this is kind of weak right here. So what I'm thinking is I'm gonna put a brace right here. I'll drill the hole to mount this in, but I'm gonna leave it just like this. I don't wanna do that C thing like I talked about, but it fit right in place. So I'll measure that height, I'll stick a piece there. I'm gonna wait and do that last because now we need to figure out how we're gonna mount these amplifiers. So I'll meet you over at the workbench. And the reason why I don't wanna put that on yet is because when wiring up the amplifiers, it's gonna be flopping around and doing all that fun stuff like a burger on a grill. I don't wanna keep hitting it. The amplifier we're gonna use to power the front stage is the RA90S. In typical Alpine fashion, it comes wrapped in bubble wrap. Comes with the instruction manual and the test specifications. Inside the amp, they also give you this, which is kind of unique. This is a power rating chart to tell you how long the power wire should be according to how much amperage there is being drawn. It's kind of nice. It is in meters though, so yeah. On the side of the bubble wrap, you'll find this little package right here. 
you're gonna need this. These are the feet for the amplifier. If you'll notice, there's no way to screw this thing down as of right now. The Alpine logo for the center of this just has a little tiny piece of hot glue on it. And then there is some tape on both sides so you can decide which way you want this. You can spin it any way you want for making your installation easier and better. For right now, I'm gonna put this in the owner's manual bag. In typical Alpine fashion, it has some plastic ends on it. But the nice thing is, is these don't have to come off in order to put the wiring in the amplifier. The screws are coming in at an angle, but the mounts on the speakers at least are straight. The power has those stupid inputs that come in like this. So we're gonna have to put the amplifier on risers so that the wire can turn. On this end, we have all our controls, except for the input level, high and low, is located next to the RCAs here. You'll notice there's no high-low plug on this. They're gonna be done through the RCAs. It has 330 amp fuses. Positives are across the top, negatives across the bottom. One through six, one being on the inside, Side, six being on the outside. Ground, remote, battery. On the other end, all the controls. Has a bass knob input if you're gonna be using this like a five channel amplifier. Because in the day, even though it's a six channel, it can be a five channel. Channel one and two, gain control. Next is your filtering. You have off, high pass, and high pass high, which looks to me like a 10 time multiplier switch. It goes from 50 to 400 on our first set, which would just be high pass, and then high pass high goes from 400 to 6,000, picking off where this left off. Channel three and four are next. First up is input channels. This is for how you plan on feeding channels three and four. You have your choice of feeding it with inputs one and two RCA or feeding it with channels channel three and four input RCA. For us, we are gonna be using inputs one and two because the front channel is going to be tweeters, this is going to be mid-range. Filter, off, high pass, and band pass. The band pass will be 50 to 400, as well as 400 to 6,000. We'll be selecting band pass for this. Also going back, we'll be selecting high pass high for the front channels. For those of you confused with band pass, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be setting a the highest frequency the mid range will play up to and the lowest frequency they're going to play down to. And these two controls will allow us to do that. Channels five and six, similar to three and four, inputs one and two can feed it or input inputs five and six. We'll be using inputs one and two. Next is gain. And then we have low pass filter on and off. We're gonna be using this as low pass because we need to set up a band pass for this as well. Just like on this where you had two knobs, this is going to be set up the same way, but we're going to be using our radio to complete the band pass for five and six. What that translates out to is we'll set the radio's high pass filter for let's say 80 hertz and we'll set this low pass filter for whatever meets up with the mid range, usually somewhere around 350, 400, which is great because this has a frequency range of 50 to 400. And that will complete the two band pass filters we need one for mid-range and one for mid-bass, which is one of the reasons why we chose this amplifier. The other is the fact that it has staggered power. It has 75 watts by four for the front four channels and 150 by two for channels five and six, giving us that extra power for the bigger mid-bass driver. The little parts bag is filled with a bunch of little silver screws and four feet. These guys here, they have a little indention on them. Flipping the amplifier over, there's two nip here and here. This will sit just like that. Those silver screws will screw it in place. Now that we know how this amplifier is configured, the next step is to get these screwed onto here, get the amp board underneath it, and figure out how this is all gonna go together with our sub amp also. Normally when you find an amplifier like this, how it's broken down is the RCAs and are on one side, and all the power are on the other side. Alpine didn't do that with this. Controls are all here. Everything else is located on this side, which is not the end of the world. They kind of give you the option to mount it in many different ways, but we are of course limited in the fact that we have to keep this hole open here for screwing this thing into the car. 
which means we're going to have to go with a conventional style mount where it's gonna sit like this. And then we'll have to do all of our routing after the fact. Power is gonna be on this side of the car, so it makes the most sense to put this onto that passenger side of the car, to keep all the power wire routed the way it needs to go. As of right now, that's just my thinking as of this moment. It may not, it may change. We might wanna flip it around and go the other way. It just depends on how we have to route it. If we leave it like this, one of the drawbacks is gonna be the power is right here. It's gonna come back, which means all our signals either gonna to have to do this way or we're gonna to have to build bridges for the wire and have everything pass underneath it which is the same if we spin the amplifier around this way. Now that puts our power wire at the top here, bring it all the way around, down, and then up, but it frees up all of this to not have to have bridge and takes up this area here. So I'm not sure yet which one is going to make the most sense to me. We'll figure that out. Let's see what the sub amp is gonna do. We are gonna be using his X-type mono amplifier to power his subwoofers from his previous install. He doesn't have all the cool accessories for it. So I might remove this, I haven't decided yet. But this amplifier has that more conventional, all the wires are on this end and it's a narrow amplifier. We can run the power this way. The RCAs will have to go that way. Speaker wire can go up there because it's just a sub wire. So we will have to build some kind of a power bridge here for these RCAs to pass under. And then we have a distribution block, which we're gonna be using the T-Spec zero gauge in to four gauge out. My plan is to set it somewhere over here. Now I have to be able to get that screw in. Bringing this amp as far forward as I can really doesn't leave me a lot of room to run the four gauge around that way. If I push this amplifier all the way up here towards the front of the mount, I can bring this down. And if I make a piece that comes off to this side here, I can just bring the wire over. Keeping in mind that I have to raise this amplifier up because of the way these power wires are designed, it might be better for me to raise all of the RCAs and wire and bring them around this way as opposed to raising the power wire, keep that down low. So these are the things that we constantly think about when designing the layout for this type of thing. Some people would say, we'll just wrap the wire underneath, bring it over here, which is a total doable thing. I don't like to put a ton of wire underneath the amplifier. I don't mind doing the occasional thing. And there's also room up underneath this so I could drill holes and have them just come to the back side of this. But I know most people, when we do an installation like this, people wanna see the wiring. That's why they have us do it. So I think if we stare at this a little bit, we'll come up with the right answer and start prepping this thing to get it into the car. Sometimes the solution is so simple it's staring you in the face. Or you just ask your partner to take a look at it and say, hey man, what do you think of these two ideas? And they go, well, why don't you just do this? And then you go, yeah, duh. Fernando looked at the problem. He's like, why don't you just mount the high zamp towards the front? That'll give you plenty of room to run the wiring for power over to this side instead of around the back like I was thinking. And our signal wire will be right here out of the way. We can run this RCA over and down. We put both amplifiers on risers, so we have plenty of room to do that. And the power wire will stay right across here. We still have room to put our screw in. And everything is hunky-dory. We can put the logo on here. This one doesn't have one, which is a total bummer. We need to start getting this all wired up. When I wire up amplifiers, I like to think of them as zones or regions. First region is your signal routing, meaning the RCAs, where are they gonna go? Second is speaker and how those are gonna go. And last is the power region and how they're gonna go. Now you can do in any order you want. I mean, you can do power, signal, then speaker. It doesn't matter. Don't jump around, meaning get all the RCA section done or all the power wire done first and then move on to the next one. Be thinking of how these wires have to run. So like I know these two have to cross. When I'm coming down, I have to make sure that I come down far enough that I can tuck it in. Also, when this power wire comes around, I know it has to clear this screw, so it's gonna be somewhere in this area. Be aware of what you're doing as far as your wire routing. To keep the wire nice and pretty, make sure you head over to mobilesolutions-usa.com and pick up your wire ruler. Because this has a premium audio system, there's an amplifier located in the driver's kick panel with all the wiring that we need to get to these speakers, except for the tweeters, which we said we're running new wires to, but we had them go directly to that. To integrate into the factory wiring, we're going to be using the iData AFO 
three. The reason this harness exists is if we were going to keep the factory radio, we could go into a DSR-1 or any other compatible AR product, plug into where the factory amplifier is, plug into that module, and add a full system from there. Preamps, the whole nine yards, it'll integrate into the car. It also works as a wonderful adapter for this instance where we're putting a new radio in. We need to bypass the factory amplifier. I don't want to cut all the harnesses because these all plug in. In the harness, we get the gray connector that's going to match up to the factory gray connector. This is going to give us our door speakers as well as our rear deck speakers. And they are factory colors, gray, green, purple, and white, just like the ones we talked about for the radio. And the brown harness have the mid-range and center channel wires. We won't be using the center channel, but we'll be retaining the mid-range. So we'll use these white and gray, and they have a red stripe. The red stripe is negative. And then if we need to loop any of the wiring from the radio, such as like the rear speakers to be powered off the radio because doing a front stage upgrade. Well, you can use these here and loop them into their corresponding harnesses over here. And just like the RR harness, remove all the tape, figure out how we want it to go, hop into the car, unplug the amplifier. We can plug these in and run our wires to them. We're not ready to do that yet, but I wanted to talk about how this harness was going to make installation into this car a lot cleaner. We won't have to go and cut all these factory harnesses. For me, the first thing I'm gonna start with is the RCAs, the input signal. I've prepped my cable for this, and then I've put colored ends on to denote what is happening. I always keep the subwoofer just naked, and then everything else has that same white, gray, green, purple on them. And I put it on both ends. I'm gonna start with the sub amp. We've also decided to add in a bass knob. I'm gonna run that with my RCA also. And I wanna keep it tucked up into the amplifier. I need to come all the way out with it because I still have all that power wire here that's going to wrap around. I like to run my fingers along the RCAs to get them as straight as possible. You don't want to get them all tangled and whatnot, especially when you're doing something like this where there's a six channel RCA. Plug it into the amp. Make sure when you get started here to leave enough RCA so that you can unplug these and plug these back in if you need to. Don't make it so tight that you can't do that. When putting in your zip ties, you have to pay attention to where the head is going to be, especially if you're going to add more zip ties into the hole so that it frees up the hole. The head ten tends to block the hole and it makes it hard to put another zip tie in. When I put them in, I'm going to put them starting at the front hole closest to this amplifier. That way the head is closest to this and that'll leave the hole open if I need to drill any more holes to run wires along. And that is the run for the RCAs. A closer look, we have the two here. Stack them side by side so it still looks like one RCA and then they turned in to meet this. That's why I stacked them side by side like this so they could turn and make this. This one is laying flat. These are on top of it like this. So you have these two and that will allow me to bring this into the single strand RCA. Keep it looking like a single RCA all the way down to it initially ends here at the bottom. It will wrap up to the back side of the car and come back around to the front. Next, I'm going to deal with my speaker wires. For that, I've made up a bundle. We have whites and grays, and then we have three colors depending on what speaker is going to what. The black stripe, which is going to be the mid bass, blue stripe, which will be the mid range, orange stripe, which is going to be our tweeter. They'll come in just like this, mount up against, and then turn and head into the amplifier so it maintains that same look. When putting the zip ties in along this side, the heads are on the outsides here because I knew I was going to be coming back in with the speaker wire. We taped this up and then I added a piece of shrink wrap here to the end to finish it off. I know all my zip ties are lined up exactly how I need them. I just need to figure out where my turn point is here in the center. And that means that this guy is going to be my first drill point. Line it up with that hole from the wire ruler. One of the cool things about having this amplifier up on risers is the wire ruler does come with a shorter version of it, but I can slide up underneath it here and make these now that I have this wire here, so I can't use the whole ruler. When it's time to do that, the top row was positive, the bottom row is negative. That means I'm going to cut them shorter so they'll be like this. And then I'm going to add some wire ferrules onto the ends of each one of the wires. I also have some red and black heat shrink so that 
that I can have it look more uniform. But the first step is to get this zip tied down into place and then we'll add the ferrules and screw it in. Speaker wires are in and all set. We are going to have to set the crossovers on this. When we're done, we're gonna be using a crossover calibrator. To do that, we need to undo all of these speaker wires. Note to self, when you're getting to that point where you're gonna put these in, torque them down just enough to hold them in place, but that's it. Don't do the final twist on them yet because all of them are gonna have to come out. That leads to the last, which is the power side of things. But the first thing we're gonna do in that is the remote turn on because the remote turn on is gonna go down the driver's side of the car with these pieces. I have some remote turn on that I've already cut into place. One is longer than the other. This gives us a good time to kind of talk about what a ferrule is. You strip this wire and then you put it into the little twist down terminal like something like this where it has a screw. What happens is it tears the wire and that isn't the greatest thing you could hope for. Ferrule is a little tiny sleeve like this that goes over the wire and that will help it to bundle it together. But the finishing touch on that is to use a ferrule crimper. And what that does is that compresses the wire in and makes it like a solid lug. You should be able to pull on it just like this. And now when that screw goes in, it's not going to tear the wire apart. However, tighten it up. You don't have to like, argh, argh. you know, you're not torque wrenching this thing. I have blue TechFlex. Measure my wire out here. I also have blue heat shrink. Cut a small portion of it, go over the end, heat it up. Now on these X-Series amplifiers, they have these cool power plugs, but they go in plug side up. Power wires are on the sides, which is fine, but the remote turn on is on the bottom. I need to get that in now, and that'll plug it into place here. I've drilled my holes next to my RCA, and we'll get the remote turn on in this amplifier, and we'll take a look at that. The remote turn on wire is all done. Came out of this amplifier, followed the two along the side here, and it just comes down and around around and off to the bottom with the rest of these. And that finishes the signal, the remote turn on, but the remote turn on is part of the power, which we're not done yet. I've put together some runs of power wire. One for here, it's gonna come up around and hidden into this one. I have my distribution over here for my power. That is the next step of this, figuring out how this is going to go. I'm gonna ground it over here in this corner. There's a factory hole here. I made my wire long enough for that. And I want to keep it tucked in this way and across this. Plug it into the amplifier and then just kind of get an idea of where I want to run this. I've got a power that I need to keep in mind is gonna come around this side. This ground wire comes into this amplifier like that. And then it also has a power wire. Could pinch them together and have all four wires lined up here. I could also go on top of each other like this till I get over to this side and then lay them down flat. But the only thing to do is of course just do it and figure it out. I opted to go for or the stack on top of one another and then fan out on this side. But let's take a closer look at all of this. At that point where Fernando's getting ready to start mounting his fuse holder and I think he's already got the hole through the firewall but I kind of want him to explain what you have to do in a Mustang to well do it right. It's nobody this is electric car. No it's not. We already took the battery out. This is the tray. It has three eights right there. But first you gotta take the, the battery, remove the two 10 millimeters, remove the harness, Put it away. Now why did you do that? For us to be able to drill a hole and run our wire, this is gonna be a zero gauge, you can run two four gauge. You got plenty of space in this side right here. You just gotta go under the bend. Where do you mount the fuse holder? We're gonna run our wire right here, right behind this, because water comes here and everything. Fuse is gonna be on this side. Put some blue tape. This hole, it's already here, it has a clip. Remove the clip, I'm just gonna put nut in the bolt. What are we making the fuse holder out of? We're gonna make our fuse as a quarter inch ABS. So this one is gonna mount to the side as an angle like this. We use some of these bolts. 
and goes there. All right, through the magic of video, let's take a look at the finished product. And there we go, mounted in place. You can see that bolt right there holding it in. You've already attached it to the battery terminal here. Of course, the battery's not in yet, that's next. One of the things that you guys need to know if you're going to be connecting this to the battery terminal is that Ford anodizes this whole piece right here. They anodize the whole thing black. You have to remove all of that in order to connect the battery here. If you don't, you're not gonna make a good contact at all. We've tested this, it sucks you lose a ton of voltage, like hardcore lose a ton of voltage. Take a wire brush, scrape this all off, make it all silver, the whole thing through, and you'll be fine. Get out of my way so I can put the battery. If all the wires ran, this thing is, this thing is done. Oh, thank God. Now it's time to get it into the car. Power wire follows the factory harness along all the back here. It comes along to the floor and here, and it's going to go into our distribution block. Our speaker wire and everything will also follow the same route coming in through here and all the way around. The only thing that is going to go over this is going to be the base knob because it's not long enough to do that. We'll make sure we insulate the heck out of it. It's nice and thin anyways. That way we don't run into any issues as it moves forward into the car. I need to make the brace for here and of course start running the wires up front. But the first thing I want to do is get this zero gauge attached here. We can hook up the battery now and get the car back to on as it were and we can move seats and stuff. The next thing I need to do is this ground spot here isn't actually threaded. So we have a tap and die set and we're going to drill in some threads. It's an M6. One of the reasons I like to get the power and ground connected as soon as we get in here is honestly so that I don't forget. Once you start running the speaker wires and RCAs and all that, the installation kind of snowballs and moves a lot faster. And the next thing you know, you're done you go and you turn it on and you realize it's not working and now you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Only you realize you forgot to ground the amplifier. All right, now power and ground, both connected, both done. Don't have to worry about that anymore. But what I do have to worry about is a ton of speaker wires and RCAs going up this driver's side of the car. I need to get started on as well as insulating the base knob. I'll meet you in the driver's front kick area, which is where the speaker wire is headed to, to use that ARFO3 harness to plug into the factory amplifier harness. Located high up in the driver's footwell, you see the black, gray, brown plugs. That is the factory amplifier. Ford has been putting some form of an amplifier there on the Mustangs for a really long time, depending on how far back you want to go. Previously, they were located up underneath the rear deck. There was two big amplifiers there. After that, version of the car because it really took up a lot of trunk space. They shoehorned two small amplifiers up into the kick which has then been graduated into one big amplifier and that's what they're running with now. We just need to unplug that. We already made the harness. We can plug it in, solder up all our connectors. We are going to need a couple tools to make sure that everything is the way we want it because we put speakers in here. We're going to solder these connections. I don't feel like changing things later or cutting connections. So we're going to polarity check each one of these now before we solder them together. And for that we'll need the Mobile Solutions PT98 Plus. I will say getting this thing out is a pain. There's a 10 here, there's a 10 up higher, so if you don't need to remove it, don't. But it is a nice place to hide crossovers. Now it does help to have two of them so that you can do your polarity popping here, connect your wires, and then take this around to farther parts of the car and check. It works real simple. It has two test leads, red and black, connect them to the speaker, 
it'll make that popping noise. Turn this on to in, there's an in and an out, and then take it over to the speaker. This one is giving us a green light. That means the speaker's moving out. If the speaker was moving in, it would give us a red light. What we're looking for is all the speakers to be moving in the direction we want. We want these all to move green, move on to the next speaker. This one is also moving green. I'll have Fernando test the other door for me. Getting a green, and we're getting a green there. And lastly, we have the tweeter giving us a green also. Now I can solder in all my wires with my stripes and solids and be confident that this connection will be the way I want it. All the speakers are going the direction we need them to go. All the wires are soldered now. Sorry for not letting you guys watch that boring endeavor. What I like to do at this point is because like a lot of the times I get pulled away and I never get to focus on one thing. Fernando's asking a question or Paul asks a question or I gotta go next door. And Before I put the shrink wrap on, I like to just look at every single wire and not be distracted to make sure I didn't goof up. Put my hands on each one. Black, black, solid, 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 colored. The ones like these that we run where it's gray and it's orange, it's easy to do. But like on theirs, they have white with a red stripe. That needs to go to this blue, which those are negative, but this is white. And it is easier to check the negatives. And once they're all good, slide the heat shrink over and put your finger at your stopping point. That way you don't have to sit there and try to guess. So on this end we have some shrink wrap. That's an obvious break point, but on this end we don't. I'm gonna wrap it a few times with the exterior Tessa tape. Come back with my interior Tessa tape, which I like to put over these connections like this because this stuff comes off real easy if we ever need to get to it. And that's it, that's all done. Now the reason why I do this, I don't wanna to have to pull off two or three feet of tape trying to find something. I want all my connection points in an obvious and easy to get to so I can minimize any waste. So if I have to pull this off, I'm only losing six inches of tape instead of like if I were to tape it all the way up into the dash, I gotta pull a lot of stuff apart. I'm gonna get this all buttoned up, get the kick panel, the running board on. The last thing to do is the radio and the dash and then we can start setting everything up. We'll turn it on just to make sure everything works, but then we have to do crossover calibrator and the DD1. Fernando is anxiously waiting for me. He did call me over because he wanted me to see something. I asked him to rewire the subwoofer enclosure box because we're just gonna run one 10 gauge out to it. He had the subwoofers mounted upside down so the speaker cups are on the top and not on the bottom. Okay, but he goes, dude, you gotta see this. All right, so. So the subwoofer box was his filing cabinet? Oh, yeah. I mean, what better place the higher you, you own voices than your subwoofer box. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good times. Find it. Awesome. One of the cool things about this Alpine is the fact that this harness has everything that we need to attach into the car not attached to the radio. That means we can plug everything in and then plug it all into the radio. Kind of cool. There's three harnesses that need to plug into the radio. The rest of this stuff needs to get tucked down below the radio and as far out of the way as possible. Well, it is definitely a super tight fit in the dash. Bezels in place. One of the criteria for this install was that the screen not cover the gauges. So I need to bring the screen down about two inches. And that's done by adjusting these two screws on either side. I think that works. Allows us to see the gauges. We can still get to the knobs. Going back in the Alpine parts bag, grab the little silver screws with the blue Loctite on them. The last thing to install are the cool little covers for the side. Ah, that was a workout. First thing up before we set the crossovers is to do the distortion detector. The reason you want to do this first is once you've set the crossovers, you might go out of the frequency that this uses. This uses the frequencies 1000 and 40. That means the mid range and the mid bass would be totally out of the range of this. We have a tone plane right now, 0 dB, 1000 Hertz. Crank it up all the way, Fernando. I have no distortion. That's great. And we do get some gain. 
Add zero dB, play negative five. My plan is to set everything to negative five and then go back and turn things down to blend it together. Moving on to the mid-range channel. And then lastly, the mid-bass channel. We'll move on to the subwoofer amplifier. Switching tracks to 40 hertz. Volume on the radios all the way up. And there we go, all our gains are set. Next, we'll move on to the crossovers. A couple things you need to know before you set up the crossover points. For one, the tweeter is the most important thing. You don't want to blow your tweeter. We need to know the FS of the tweeter. Alpine, which I cannot understand why, does not publish any of these numbers. If they do, we can't find them. But that's okay. Thanks to Diamore and Steve Mead, we have the IMSG+. And what this is designed to do is find that point. And it does it automatically, which is really nice. The old one, IMSG, did it as well. It just didn't do it automatically. It had to turn the dial really slow. We have both. This one is way more efficient. It's going to play a test tone, and as I turn this dial, it's going to look for the highest ohm load. That is going to tell us that number. And then we need to multiply that number by 2, 2.5, two 3, 4, in order to get a good crossover point. This guy listens to rap music, which means we want to put it a little bit higher than we would, let's say, somebody that listens to 80s and 90s rock because we don't want them to just destroy these things. For those of you who are like, I don't have any of this cool stuff, a good place to start is 3200. Press clear, turn the dial slowly, makes noise. When it's done, you can look at it. We have 1.77 kilohertz, perfect. We know what we need. We can take that number and now multiply it and get our crossover points. Turn the radio down. Green, good. When this lights up green and you're playing your test tone, select read. You're gonna get an arrow here that's gonna tell you to turn it up or down. We get a blue light, that means where we need to be. We still need that frequency though because we need it for the mid-range, which is gonna be the top. So we'll move our jumpers down, select off, select on, read. This amplifier has notches in it. Really hard to stop. As you can see, it's right between it. So we'll just get as close as we can. Next up, go to 350. And just like before, the frequency falls right in the middle. Okay, but that's okay. We have the crossover set. We're gonna be using the radio to set the subamp crossover, so we don't need to do that. We can now move on to screwing the wires back in and actually taking a listen to it. All the wires are screwed back into the amplifier. We've honestly been playing with it for a little while, trying to gain match everything. I asked him the type of music he listened to. He very pointedly said, Rap. No hesitation, nothing. So that means rap it is. I'm not a rap guy. Fortunately for Fernando, he has a young teenage daughter. Hello, rap. Rapping Christmas presents, rapping birthday presents. Rapping, rapping. So we're using his playlist. He's sitting in the driver's seat because he's way better at this than I am. I haven't listened to this kind of music in a while, so it does me no good. I'm tweaking and he's yay nay in it. We don't have the subwoofers hooked up yet. I'm gonna play three seconds of a song. Thank you, YouTube. Told me I should go and sell drugs, niggas with the jail. Ain't nobody put the bail on. It hurts my ears. Is that the goal? It is the goal. I, I like it. Okay. Um, we did turn a hair. Just just a hair. Just a hair down. Nothing, nothing more. Just just a hair. Thought the tweeters were coming in just a little too like in your face. Cause I mean they're they're right in your face. I mean, they're right there. Just a hair, not enough. Fernando says he, he didn't hear a difference. I heard a difference. We need to get the subwoofers in. Oh, we also mixed in the rear speakers just, just to the right amount. Mm -hmm. Basically what we did is we wanted them to be present because we, we were going for the overall volume of the system. So we're just kind of turning our heads and making sure that the sound just doesn't disappear. It's a good way to blend in the rear speaker. Like when you're sitting like this, it's not distracting, but if I go like this, mm -hmm. then you, the sound doesn't stop. You notice. That's how we blend in the rear speakers for people that want predominant rear speaker. I normally blend like this. I just go like, I push a button or flick a toggle. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's I, new I, technology, man. I know. I know. <laughs> we added in this stopper right here to this so that subwoofer won't go sliding around because this is a route. <laughs> So 
So a quick checklist as always when we're done with the car, subwoofers are in, subwoofer mount is in, base knob works, steering wheel controls work, backup camera works, amps are set, crossovers, gains, all that fun stuff, mm -hmm. fuses underneath the hood, obviously the battery's back connected. Am I missing anything? The testing will control works, everything works. Dash is all snapped back together. Always do a once over, make sure all the parts are mm -hmm. in the car, like you didn't miss like, the side of the dash, these, there's these little plastic panels. They go right here. You don't notice them, right? Because the door is closed. Every car usually has them. Make sure those go back in. This one's ready to go. It's ready to be delivered. That's it. You like it? Yeah, I like it. Perfect. Well, end the show. On to the next one, guys. You guys have a great night as always. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye.